This conference will now be recorded. Click on that and it starts recording. All right, Sylvia is going to open us with a prayer and we'll get started in Psalms. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for a wonderful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And we're so thankful for each and every day, Lord. We know that each breath is a gift from you. Father, we know that you are a good, good father, and we trust you for all of our prayer requests that we've spoken and also the unspoken ones, for those who could be here, for those who uh, could not be here tonight, we lift them up as well. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to your word, that we might apply it uh, in our lives and through the Holy Spirit. We cooperate with your Holy Spirit today, and we thank you for all these wonderful blessings in the power of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Amen. And we also need to remember uh, Boyd Nixon, who is on a missions trip right now in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. He does that missions trip twice a year, and many people come to a saving knowledge because of what they do up there uh, with that mission. Uh, group um, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, okay, so if you're following along, we are uh, in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 85, and we'll begin this study in verse number one. Uh, and in this Psalm, this author is giving uh, thanks unto God. And why? Because God is a God of forgiveness and he is a God of restoration. Uh, and this man is experiencing, this writer is experiencing uh, forgiveness and restoration uh, in his life. And he is also experiencing forgiveness and restoration in the lives of the nation of Israel. And as we study this psalm, uh, we can learn a great lesson on how we should offer thanksgiving unto God. All right, we'll start with... Uh, the first eight verses. So, um, Arnie, can I get you to read verses one through four and then Diane, verses five through eight, please, nice and loud. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. You withdrew all your rain and wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants but let them not turn to folly. Oh, sure. So the writer makes it very clear here in this verse number eight that the purpose of forgiveness is not just so that the guilty can be freed of their, of their guilt, but rather notice that the purpose of forgiveness is so when you receive forgiveness that you will be able to have a change in your life he's saying here god is turning away his wrath and so now after god turns his wrath away from us we should not go back to our own folly uh there's a saying in one of the verses i can't remember what it is but they're talking about dogs going back to their own vomit this is kind of what they're talking about you don't once once God has forgiven you for, for your iniquity, uh, you're not supposed to go back <clears throat> and have the same behavior patterns, but rather you are to change. And of course, if you don't know what behavior patterns that you need, you have to just read the written word of God. It deals with everything we need to know about in life. You remember Jesus uh, and the woman at the well uh, who committed adultery, uh, he didn't say you are forgiven, so now you can just go back and, and resume your lifestyle. No, what did he say? He said, you are forgiven, now go and sin no more. So the purpose for God's restoration work 
is not so we can go back to our former lifestyle, but rather uh, we are forgiven so that we can then have a changed life. And so one of the greatest expressions that any of us can give to God is for us to show up in our life with changed behavioral patterns that are, are matching or aligning with the written word of God. Uh, uh, we live a changed life. Imagine, uh, for example, you have a friend, a close friend who, who comes to you and, he's, and he says, uh, uh, I gambled all of my money away. Uh, I can't pay my rent this month. I can't feed my children this month. And you talk with this person and you decide, okay, you're going to, you're going to be uh, like, like Jesus would be. And you're going to, you're going to offer some support and forgiveness. And you give that person some money to help them feed their family and keep a roof over their head. How would you feel? If the money that you gave them, you find out that that person went down to 7-Eleven and spent the entire amount on lottery tickets, would it not make you angry? I think we can all agree it would make us angry. And so uh, how, how much more offensive is it to our God in heaven when he forgives us for some iniquity that we have committed in our life? for us to go back and repeat the same sin over and over again. It's offensive to God, and God does not want us to turn back to our old lifestyle, but rather God wants us to have a changed life. Notice also in verse eight, that we're not only to listen to the word of God, but also we are to govern our lives according to the word of God. Uh, what, what good does it do for you to just listen to the to the Bible, but not apply it to your life. It does no benefit for the kingdom. It does not show any kind of a respect for God. Uh, we are to govern our lives according to scripture. Um, all right, we'll pause for a moment or two. Who's got a comment or a question on the first eight verses? Uh, comment or question, take away. Sylvia, you're first. Okay, so the Lord is a God of restoration, love, salvation, and peace. Uh, we need to receive his forgiveness and also receive a changed life, forsaking the old ways of foolishness. So he loves us too much to leave us as we were before salvation. He is going to send his Holy Spirit once we receive him to help us to break the old ways or old nasty habits uh, that we were prone to prior to salvation. So when we repent of sin, we need to yield to that Holy Spirit and allow him to affect the change that God is asking for us uh, to accomplish in our lives. Good job. Who else has another comment, a question, or a takeaway? Anybody? Yep. I see a hand waving. Yeah, somewhere. They're there in the crowd. One of my groupies wants to talk. Yeah, so uh, to, add, to build to what Sylvia is saying, uh, uh, it's about trust, right? The more we, the more we trust God, the more we trust the Son, uh, the more we will be able to hear and and grow, right? So the Scriptures uh, work with people that trust God and trust His Son. Good job. And that, and that trust is, is really faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So as we trust, we show we have faith in him. Good job. Any other comments before we move on to verse 9? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Carrie, can I get you to read verses 9 through 13? Nice and loud. Unmute, please. All right. Clearly, his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, 
the Lord shall give that which is good, and our Lord shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. All right, so to quote Sylvia, who uh, says every week that blessing always follows obedience. So when, when we are fundamentally right with God, so when God forgives us and we have a change of life and we align our life according to the written word of God, blessings will follow. In fact, you can count on showers of blessings, uh, abundant blessings, when you uh, order your life according to the written word of God. All right, before we get on to uh, Psalm 86, who's got a comment or a question about any of the 13 verses in Psalm chapter 85? Sylvia, go ahead. Well, I love the verse 10 that says, righteousness, love, and peace kiss each other. What a beautiful uh, uh, description. I think it's lovely. When, when righteousness, love, and peace coexist, that's a great place to be. You don't see that in this world. So we know where to, to seek it. it. It might be found in the Bible. It'll be found in the presence of the Lord and his Holy Spirit. Good job. Arn, did you have something? All right, well, I'll speak instead of Arn. Uh, you know, this reminds me actually, because it's repeated all throughout the Old Testament that, you know, blessings are always following obedience. Uh, reminds me of the Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, the first part of that chapter, it says, if you do these things, uh, you will uh, you will receive blessings. And if you then the second half of that chapter says, if you do these things, you will receive curses. So, I mean, there are not just hints throughout the Bible, but there are all instruction, specific instruction. If you do these things, according to the written word of God, you will be blessed. If you don't do those things, uh, you will receive curses. And I think what's fascinating, because I've been around the Christian community for a long, long time now, about 17, 18 years now, uh, and I hear a lot of people in the churches say that that the Old Testament is just filled with uh, with judgment and the New Testament is filled with grace and mercy. But when you go back and study, it's not true. Thank you. I heard that in the <laughs> background. Much, yeah. uh, so... So in Deuteronomy 28, those those verses that I just quoted, uh, where I didn't quote, I paraphrased, uh, where it says, if you do these things, you will be blessed. And if you do these things, you'll be cursed. In English, it sounds the same. But where it says you will be blessed, it's a different Hebrew word. Then you will you will receive curses. The Hebrew word that's used where you'll receive blessings, it has the meaning of you will get those blessings swiftly. Those blessings will come to you swiftly from those the o obedience of those things that are listed. And then where it says you will receive curses, even though it sounds the same in English, in Hebrew, it's a different word. And what the meaning is from the Hebrew is that it will come to you slowly and deliberately. And there is a format of grace in the Old Testament because God is going to be slow to judge because he wants to grant you some time to repent and to turn from your ways. He's not just going to judge you immediately, but he will show you signs that you're in the wrong direction and give you sufficient time to turn around before judgment is issued against uh, any any sin. Sylvia? So it's like a yellow, and when it comes to curses, it's like a yellow light, a yellow light, a yellow light, a yellow light and finally people refuse to listen to god and reject god and then they get some judgment in their lives and and when we do things that god wants us to do we're in the will of god according to his word he blesses us right away and it's and we notice that it circles a blessing it's like okay this blessed me and then it blessed him and oh by the way pamela blessing when we're cooperating with the Holy Spirit and we see that in our Bible study all the time yes we do good job who else has a comment or a question go ahead Carrie on Psalm 85 I just want to say so the bottom the last 
verses are telling what happens when God has turned his face to to us. Or right now, the, the, the people of Israel, I think he's talking about at this point now, they are not under his wrath. He has, you know, he's shining upon them. Therefore, all these, he is what they have asked. Verse six, show, will, thou re, will thou not revive us again? that the people may rejoice in thee. And then um, now he, this is the description of what happens when he has shown his salvation. Who is Yeshua? Yeah, yeah and, and again, uh, anytime you see the words my salvation or salvation in the English part of the Hebrew Bible, uh, if you go back to the Hebrew, you will find that that is Jesus's personal name. So Yeshua, Joshua, uh, that's uh, Yehoshua, that's, uh, that's Hebrew, that's transliteration. It doesn't tell you what it means. The translation is my salvation or the one who saves. So when Mary was going around Israel introducing her new little son, she was saying, this is my salvation uh, in the original language. Very, very cool. Yeah, so I was talking to, uh, to Dan about that earlier. You, you, you don't want to transliterate uh, the, the names of people or the names of locations in the in the Hebrew Bible, you want to translate them so you can see what they mean. Bethlehem, like Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. the house of bread, like uh, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, uh, Melech is uh, king, Tzadik is righteous, so Melchizedek means righteous king. Read that the translation back in to uh, those verses. Read it back in there. Who else has a comment or question? Anybody back behind me? Roger and I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Probably won't have an answer, but we have a question. What verse was that? 12? Uh, yeah. 12, yeah. No. That's back here. 11. Mm. 11 says, truth sprouts from the earth. Truth. Em yeah, I thought that was em it sprouts from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. So truth sprouts from the earth so i wonder if that's a messianic reference i am the way the truth and the life yeah it could be uh, uh, the, uh the truth and the life jesus came to earth truth sprouted on the earth yeah um potentially yeah and, uh, interesting so so some of your bibles say faithfulness uh dan your bible says truth well it's emmet the word is emmet the, in, in the, yeah so in the hebrew emmet uh, means truth. Right. And what's interesting about uh, the word emmet, I'll give you a little Hebrew lesson here. I know you didn't ask for one, but I'll give it to you anyway. Emmet is spelled in the Hebrew uh, uh, alphabet. It's the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter. And we know uh, that in the very first verse of the Bible, uh, it uses the word Aleph Tav, uh, where uh, where it's saying that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, how did he create it? He spoke it into existence. He spoke it into existence. Well, how, what did he speak? He created the Hebrew language to speak everything into existence, nothing arbitrary in Hebrew. And so when it comes to the word truth, and there is no version of truth, there is only one truth. I should say there are no versions of truth. There's only one truth. Uh, and the, the word truth is emmet. It's the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter, which implies from a more spiritual or deeper meaning, uh, the word truth in Hebrew, emmet, means everything that was used in the Hebrew alphabet for the creation of the heavens and earth uh, from the beginning of the Hebrew uh, alphabet all the way through to the middle and all the way to the very end. Aleph is the beginning, Mem is the middle, and Tav is the end. So Emmet means uh, anything that God spoke in the Hebrew language that he created, he used to create everything, the heavens and the earth. I mean, the interesting, interesting thing when you look at uh, Emmet is the, uh, the root word for Emmet is Amon, uh, Amon, which is... Uh, uh, Abraham believed Amon. Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Yeah. So truth, the root word of truth is the belief. It's the type of belief which is which is 
you do, I, I think of it, I, 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 my mind wants to say it the other way around, that the belief comes from truth, but it's actually truth is rooted in that type of belief, the type of belief that Abraham had. Yeah, yeah, it's just by walking in faith, walking in faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Who else has a comment or a question about uh, Psalm 85? Anybody? Well, it's, uh, this word chesed. Chesed. Chesed comes through here uh, three times in this in this uh, in verse uh, seven, ten, and eleven. Uh, so in uh, seven, it says, "Show us your." In my translation, NASB says, "Show us your mercy," but show us your loving kindness, Lord. Mm -hmm. Show us your loving kindness, Yahweh or Yehovah, and grant us your salvation. Verse 10, I think Sylvia mentioned this, uh, loving kindness and truth have met together. Loving kindness, and so Hesed and, and Emma have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Righteous truth, Emma, sprouts from the earth, and righteousness looks down. Uh, uh, let me... I'm oh, sorry, uh, verse five. Uh, oh, no, twice. Uh, sorry. I, I, uh, yeah, and, and, and twice in this chapter. Yeah, and, and so what Dan was saying earlier is that could this, in fact, be a, a messianic uh, prophecy? And, and the answer is it sure sounds that way because it, Jesus is, represents the truth. Jesus represents loving kindness, and he came and up he, on the earth. And he, he, uh, he, he came to the earth, uh, suited up in a clothing of, of human nature. Go and ahead, the Dan. Third day he came up from the earth. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. 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 So yeah, this could definitely be. Uh, it sounds like a messianic prophecy. So the truth uh, came up from the earth. Who is truth? Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He came up from the earth. I am the way, the, day, the truth, right? and the life. That's right out so, of his mouth. Yeah. Love it. So Any righteousness other... comes from above. Hallelujah. Comes up. Praise God. Roger was on the other side. Good job, Good Roger. Job, Roger. And of course, hallelujah is a compound Hebrew word. Hallel means praise. praise. And Yah is a short for Yahovah, Yahweh. Yahweh. Praise God. The Gentiles say Yahweh. Gentiles say Yahweh, the Jews, Jews don't say, say that. Yehovah. Okay, they say Yehovah or Jehovah. There's no J in Hebrew, so it would be Yehovah. Any other comments before we move on? All right, we've sufficiently covered Psalm 85. Now we've gotten Psalm 86. Uh, we have another Psalm here from David. We haven't seen one of his Psalms in a while, but we studied a bunch of them earlier. Uh, and uh, David finds himself yet again in a very, very difficult stage of life. He's under a lot of uh, attack and pressure. And here we find him crying out for, uh, for help. Uh, Beth, can we get you to unmute and read verses one through five, please? And then Pamela, verses six through 10. Nice and loud, Beth. Okay. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are Forgiving and good, O oh Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Listen, Lord, to my prayer and give your attention to the sound of my pleading. On the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations, whom you have made, whom you all nations whom you have made will come and worship before you, Lord, and they will glorify your name, for you are great and you are wondrous, and you do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Good job. Um, 
You know, the first thing that jumps out to me is when you look at verse number one and it says, hear me, Lord, answer me for I am poor and needy. Well, is that how you vision David, the king of Israel, one of the richest men in the history of mankind? But here's a great lesson for all of us. It doesn't matter how much power you have or how much fame you have or how wealthy you become. Notice that David is approaching God as a humble man. Even though he was the king over all of Israel, even though he was very wealthy, he remains humble unto God. David is in, in some kind of trouble here. Uh, he will mention some of these troubles later, but notice the repetition that he has here in this Psalm. Oh Lord, or oh Lord God, you have it in verse one, verse two, verse three, verse six, verse eight, verse nine, again in 11, 12, 14, and 15. This phrase, it has the meaning of the one who is above all. The one who is above all. It has the idea of you're calling on the one who is unstoppable. When you're in trouble, it is a real good thing to have the one who is known as the unstoppable on your team. The unconquerable, the unstoppable is the one we need to call out to. David is teaching us an important lesson that when we're in trouble, we go directly to the unstoppable, the unconquerable, the God of, of the universe, and he will listen to you. Notice also in verse number nine, it sa he says, all the nations you have made will come and worship you, Lord, or worship before you, Lord. When we think about it, it's fascinating, Arnie, that we have all of the, these political and governmental regime, regimes all around the world who are against Christianity. Uh, they're against the Christian church. Uh, they're attempting, and all throughout the history of man, they're attempting to, to kill Christians. Yet among these regi regimes, uh, these communist regimes, you, we see places like, like China, places like Cuba, where Christianity, even though it's underground, it's flourishing. It's growing by leaps and bounds. You know, how many thousands upon thousands of vibrant churches are succeeding in countries like Cuba? We personally know uh, the ministry who has planted over a thousand churches in, in, in Cuba. Manny Fernandez and his, co and his company, mm -hmm. World Link Ministry, who we're happy to support, they, they continue to go throughout uh, these, these uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, South and Central America and Cuba, and they've planted all of these churches. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got China. China is one of the fastest growing Chinese uh, uh, Christian uh, communities. And, and it's right underneath the noses of all of these regimes, these government agencies who are anti-Christ. Uh, and, and the church is, is, is unstoppable. And this is why David is crying out to God. He's the God above all. When our God moves, there is no one who is capable of stopping him. Who's got a comment on the first 10 verses? Comment, question, takeaway. Sylvia's up first. Okay, so uh, in Psalms 86, Psalm 86, David cries to the Lord for help. That's the perfect place to go, okay? Giving good, abounding in love to all who cry out to him in verse five. So that's my highlight verse there. Those who cry out to the Lord, acknowledging that they are at the end of their own strength, are in the perfect position to be blessed by God. Because we acknowledge when we're in that place where all you can do is groan and cry out to God, we acknowledge that we are not able to change the circumstances that we are facing. We are not able to conquer it on our own strength in our own strength. And that is a perfect place to be, to get blessed by God. When we acknowledge he is able, we are not. He is faithful. 
you know, Lord help us with our faith. Good job. Who else has a comment about any of the first 10 verses? Uh, Carrie, go ahead. I like how, um, it, I like this chapter much like some of the other chapters where he was like really down and out and he wasn't rejoicing in God too much until the end. So he had, it had to come back to his remembrance. But in this chapter, he is reaching out to God from the beginning, no matter whatever's going on. And I like he says, preserve my soul. Preserve my soul for I am holy. Okay. Um, and he also says who who he trusts in and that okay, if you if if he will lift up he's asking the Lord to lift up his soul so that his soul can rejoice. And I think this is very deep. So when we're in similar situations, we should always go um, for the trusting in God and asking him to preserve our soul, that part of us, which is important. We do not want to ever lose our trust in God or our belief of what he can do. Like you said, that he's unstoppable because sometimes things can jump at you and and make you so so perplexed that you can easily forget that okay lord preserve my soul you know keep me let me keep rejoicing no matter what i just want to share that yeah and what what good father would not uh respond favorably to a child that comes to him or a good mother you know, what good parent would not respond favorably to that kind of a crying out? And how much more is our Heavenly Father responding to us when we cry out to him? Right. Who uh, who else has a comment? Anybody? Go ahead, uh, Arnie. Yeah, I think of these first 10 verses, the most important one is number one. Uh, you know, I had read these this psalm um, Two weeks ago and, and I remembered reading that verse and <laughs> when I didn't know the answers to the questions that Dan answered for me I remembered this that I need help uh, I'm poor and needy I'm talking about I'm poor and needy in my uh, spiritual growth Howard and I had a ha half hour conversation on the phone on Sunday about Hebrews uh, and we talked, you know, and I gave him my opinions, okay, opinions. And when I got down off the phone, I thought about what I had said and what Howard had said. And again, it reminded me how poor and needy I am. Yeah, and the fact, the fact that you're uh, expressing this in, in, in our Bible study group, uh, and acknowledging those kinds of things, that fact shows the level of increase of maturity in your spiritual walk when you can start to recognize and admit your own shortcomings and, and express your desire to want to learn and, and grow in, in with that knowledge and that understanding. So, you know, Arnie, it's... Uh, don't want it to go to your head too far, but we've watched you from the time you, you uh, before when um, you were most difficult to deal with all the way through the time that you uh, dropped to your knees in our Sunday school class and prayed for Jesus in your life. And watched you for the last several years really place a, a tremendous effort in studying the written word of God and attending Bible studies daily. And uh, it shows. Bravo. Good job. Good job. Well done. Go ahead, Arn. One more thing is, you know, when I got done talking to Howard, Howard made a comment that went straight to my heart. He said that many people have been inspired by me. And I had to think about that and say to myself, you know, don't get yourself blown up. All you're doing is asking questions, and God is asking you to having you ask those questions. Don't get yourself blown up and let it, as you just said, let it go to your head. I have to be careful with that. Yeah, just remember, uh, just remember that you're human. 
Uh, and, and you are demonstrating some amazing growth spiritually, and you're going to have a lot of people mention that to you out of their, their uh, thoughtfulness, their love, their, their wanting to encourage you. Uh, and good job. You don't want to let that grow, go to your head, but rather you want to just understand what's happening. You are growing. Bethy's next, and then Sylvia. Um, so, um, and there's somebody behind you as well. <laughs> um, but I see David's specifically asking for mercy, and he's asking for joy. And he's asking for an answer from God. Um, Thank you. Yes. Is, is there meaning meaning behind that or? Oh yeah. Go ahead. You can respond to that. Okay. So uh, asking for I'm sorry, I was writing something else. Why didn't you respond? Well, so he's he's going to God. He's asking for mercy. He's asking for answers. That's what we do when we we go to our Father. We pray. Um, and uh, and and. Uh, we want our God to respond and to help us and to save us and to fix things uh, for us. Uh, and there, there, there becomes great comfort and joy uh, from uh, the answers to our prayers. And, and not only that, even if God doesn't answer our prayers, there becomes great joy in knowing that God's just got, you've placed your faith in God, that God will handle those challenges of life. And even though you may not see uh, a change because everything's done in God's timing, not yours. But so even if you don't see a change, you can have great joy uh, knowing that God, that, that that issue, that problem, that challenge, that tragedy, whatever it is, is now in God's hands and God will take care of it for you in his timing that works best for, the, for his kingdom efforts. Sylvia? Okay, so I was going to say without faith, it is impossible to please God. So God resists the proud. And so with Arn as the example, uh, we see that Arn has gone from a position where probably one of the most unlikely people that I would ever have thought <laughs> got, would get saved because he was a very proud man. Yeah. Very proud man, right? And that's where you were before you got saved. And and it was basically you, uh, God had to prove himself uh, through the word to you in order for you to receive him. But now, since you, you have uh, humbled yourself before the living God, uh, he, you put yourself in a position so that God can work with you through his Holy Spirit to help you to learn more about him, to draw closer to him, to understand the word more. And see, God loves the humble because we know that we're just little ants compared to the living God who can speak the universe into being. So when we get in a position where we're, it's not all about us, uh, then he can work with us. Then he can grow us up into mature Christian believers and he, he can bless us, he can help us, he can use us. And in and through us, he is, he is growing us spiritually so we can we can benefit by it, and we can benefit others by it, by teaching others the same. Good job. Uh, yeah, good job. I see a hand behind me. Who is that? Oh, it's Pamela. That's me. Um, <laughs> That's Pam. Yeah, I was, I was, when someone said that uh, he was asking for joy, but the thought crossed my head that um, joy is kind of a, a personal choice. I always felt mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, asking God to give you joy. I don't know. I think I, I find that ironic because it's something that you choose. So you, you can, you, you can choose to be miserable or you can choose to be joyful. Um, so asking God to help you, I guess, is maybe what he was, he was doing. So, you you know, I, I suppose, but it's still, to me, it's a choice. You make that choice. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that assessment. I, what I said earlier was that when you put your problems, your challenges, when you go to God in prayer, say, God, please help me. Uh, you can choose joy then because you know that whatever the problem is, it's going to be taken care of in God's timing. 
you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. yeah. And also, it is a personal choice. We have to choose to yield to the Holy Spirit and say, God, what attitude do you want me to have? And if you do that sincerely, you know, over a period of time, he is going to change your attitude. He's going to give you that joy. He's going to help you realize, hey, count my blessings. I've got a lot of blessings yeah. here. Pray continuously and be joyful. Yeah, and always. be joyful. Choose that joy because we don't believe all the, the junk that the world wants to feed us, that the end is near and we're going off the off Niagara Falls with our hair on fire. We're not going to believe that <laughs> junk, okay? We know who's running the show and we know who rules victoriously and who helps us. He's on our, you know, he's on our side. And when we lift up our problems to him in prayer, we can safely trust in him. And Therefore, why, we can be joyful. And that's why when we choose joy, it makes him uh, happy. I yeah, guess. because you're word. demonstrating faith. 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 Yes. That's Amen. Right. Any others? Good job. Roger, can I get you to read uh, verses 11, 12, and 13? Nice and loud, please. We're on 86. Page two. Page two. Right here. Page two, actually. Teach me your way, Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, Lord my God, all my heart, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forever. For your graciousness towards me is great. And you have saved my soul from the depths of Sheol. Yeah, so Sheol was the realm of the dead. A true follower of God is not only interested in God filling our temporary needs. Notice in verse 11 that, that under uh, all of this pressure that David is, is experiencing, all the problems that he re what he really wants is he wants to be right before God. You know, he's saying, you know, I got problems, uh, but my real priority is I want to be right with God. I want to have God. Uh, I want to I want to follow God as the priority of my life. I want to think about the eternal realm rather than this temporary fix of this in this life. He's saying, God, teach me your ways and I will follow your ways. All of us as parents want to help our kids, and uh, we, we likely will do anything to better their lives. But as a parent, we want to see our kids grow to a level of maturity. Uh, we want to see them grow. We want to see them mature. David is reaching out to God for help with his issues. But he's also saying, I want to be right with you, God. Um, Howard, would you read verses 14 through 17? Nice and loud. Arrogant foes are attacking me, oh God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be part put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Thank you, good job. So, it's all this mess. Sorry, 
I'm, uh, I just lost my space on the phone here, and my, my notes. Okay. Well, I love the part about God's slow to anger, abounding in love. You know, when God is blessing your life, other people take note. You know, we need to brag on God. When he answers our prayers, we need to brag on him, not us. Oh, look how good my life is, whatever. No, it's look how good God is. We need to brag on God. So um, when he abounds in love toward his children, other people go, wait a minute, I want some of that in my life. It's a witness to other people. And that's what witnessing is all about, witnessing of the goodness of God in your life. So make sure when God blesses you to brag on God to other people, especially those who are unsafe. You know, when I, <laughs> I was... In, in the elevator going up and down in our condominium recently, you know, people will go, how are you doing? And they expect me to say, good. I, I say, better than I deserve. And they go, oh, really? Why is that? I go, because God is gracious to me. Look how he blessed my life. And then I talk, I brag on God. And God loves that because it could be one of those touch points where you're witnessing to somebody that there is a benefit. God is righteous and he is a, uh, and he is a uh, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I was trying to think of the scripture. Good job. That's First, what, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, that's why a, a while ago when we were talking about being blessed, I was I was thinking to myself uh, that we should we need to define blessings because mm -hmm. they can come in many forms and to one person a blessing might be considered that a blessing but to another that same blessing might not be a blessing it might be something more negative in their life so yeah so I, I was thinking we really need to define blessing is it monetary is it cars brand new cars? no no it, it, this has to do with uh, I think what this has to do with if you go back to uh, um, Matthew chapter 5 um the beatitudes you know where it says blessed is the man of this blessed is the man of that uh that's a form of the word blessing uh, really what it means is happy uh it, it it's also attached to the word shalom uh shalom has multiple meanings uh which would include uh happy it would include contentment peace. it would include peace okay. uh, fulfillment um and so wholeness. you know so wholeness more emotional, uh, blessing. it's more spiritual, spiritual emotional uh because every human being all of us contain uh the dna that we have this big black empty endless hole somewhere inside of our soul that we feel like needs to be filled and you have a lot of people who want it that try to fill that with with shopping uh, or with drugs, or with smoking, or with Alcohol drinking, or or fame, or, or, fame, uh, or whatever. Uh, and that big black hole that we have from our human nature cannot be filled except for having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And what happens then is that big black hole gets filled with shalom, with peace, uh, with happiness, with contentment with wholeness and fulfillment uh and 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 i think that's i think that's the deeper spiritual side of what we're talking about here Amen. yeah so notice in verse 14 i got lucky on that one yeah okay yeah so <laughs> notice in verse 14 uh uh uh, uh it seems to be a, a real complaint by david uh, he's saying i'm facing a group of very proud men now, there is not a more difficult uh, uh, human trait, personality trait, uh, that, that uh, is the most difficult trait to deal with is pride. The proud are coming against David in this circumstance. He cannot deal with them. And so he asks, God, will you please deal with them? Now, remember what God says about pride. Uh, pride uh, in the Bible, I believe there are six different items, like divorce. God, there, there's six items that God says that He hates, and pride is one of them. He says, uh, 
he says he, he in, in the scripture, in the Old Testament, it refers to prideful eye. Uh, that's a literal translation, but what it, what it really means is uh, a perspective, uh, how you see things. And what it means is, this is my opinion. This is my opinion. And, and that is the idea that behind a prideful eye, uh, you're getting a prideful opinion, you're getting proud thoughts, proud opinions, and God says, I hate that. That's one of the big six or seven things that he expresses that he hates in the Bible, because there's nothing that you can do when a person hangs his or her hat on prideful thoughts and behavior. So David is struggling with the prideful. Uh, he doesn't know what to do with them. Uh, and he calls out to God, will you please handle? Sylvia, go ahead. Okay, to, to uh, uh, visit this pride thing. Pride puts self on the throne of your own heart rather than God, okay? And that's a form of idolatry. That's a form of idolatry. And that's the worst form of idolatry because it's worshiping self instead of worshiping God. So that's rejecting the Holy Spirit. What is the one unforgivable sin? Rejecting the Holy Spirit because you can't get saved that way. That is why it's unforgivable. So arrogance is what pride really boils down to. Pride cometh before the fall, and the Bible says that God resists the proud. Now, if you are pr proud, prideful, you are in a very scary position because you're coming head to head with the living God, okay? <laughs> so pride is probably one of the most dangerous uh, sins that one can be involved in. To yeah, and, and God also expressed to us uh, through the Solomon that uh, the, the pride will, will ultimately fall. Yeah, and look at, look at Babylon, look at the Assyrians. They were prideful, they were arrogant, uh, they were brutal as a result because it was all about me, 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 and everybody else, they'd stick a big hook in their jaw and drag them behind a chariot, you know? I mean, it, it was, it was horrible what they did and guess what those civilizations are now dust in the desert okay that was Assyria that was Assyria yes dust in the desert there's nothing left of them another thing is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah nothing but dust in the desert okay they came against the living God <laughs> good job it's a bad place to be <laughs> Arnie what you got brother I always know when you're ready to talk yeah I, I just wanted to say there is a difference between pride and proud okay pride is a verb and proud is an adjective and i often am proud of god's works i am proud of what he has done for mankind yeah yeah good job Arne. you're emphasizing god there rather than yourself that's the difference yeah and, and prideful behavior is usually self-centered behavior yeah. yeah yeah any other comments go ahead carrie crawford from maryland go ahead well, David was going through something similar that Jesus was, went through because he dealt with the proud, the Pharisees who were against him. But David was also dealing with valid men. They were proud and they were valid. So they sought after his soul. So I kept wondering, why does he keep asking God to protect his soul? So now we learn why. He said they sought after his soul. Um, and they have not set before them. Uh, they have not set God, I think, God before them. In other words, to me, they were ungodly men. So he's, he had a lot, he had reason to cry out to God. And, um, yes. Thank you. Good, Absolutely. Nice perspective. Any other comments or questions? Anyone here? Anybody? Sylvia? Okay, we put uh, we need to put God as our priority in our life, our relationship with God. Um, we need to say, I want to be right with you, Lord. Help me to do this through the Holy Spirit. And uh, to have an eternal perspective so that the choices that we make are not driven by the fire at our feet, but from an eternal perspective, according to what the Word of God says, so that we 
make choices that are righteous. Good job. Anybody else? All right. Uh, we're going to go to Psalm number 87. We're moving right along. Uh, Hebrew scholars tell us that Psalm chapter 87 might be one of the most difficult Psalms to understand. If you study Hebrew, you'll know that there's a lot of poetic, um, what is it? Uh, po a lot of poetic uh, uh, <laughs> styling, thank you, uh, in, in uh, written in Hebrew. Uh, and um, that's why one of the reasons why many of us believe that Matthew was first written in uh, Hebrew and then changed over to Greek because there's certain poetry, if you will, uh, that could only that would only be used in Hebrew and not in Greek. And so when uh, or idioms uh, and uh, anyway, so scholars tell us that this psalm, Psalm 7, 87, is one of the most difficult psalms to understand. Uh, it's not an easy psalm to even comprehend when you read it in Hebrew if you're fluent. There's not a lot of poetry. Uh, the translation might be a little bit uh, peculiar, yet even though this is one of the most difficult ones to understand, this can be one of the most fascinating psalms for us to study. Um, Dan uh, Hershey, would you like to read? Hmm? He's on the other side of the room. Uh, would you read ver 1 through 7 of the whole Psalm 87? Here's the mic. Yeah, just your nephew. Speak loud. <laughs> your nephew. Speak loud, nephew. The foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of the city of Gad, Salia. I shall mention Rehab, Babylon, among those who know me. Behold, I'm not sure on the next word. Calistia. Felicia. Uh, and that's what was said. Tyree with Cush. There was, I'm sorry, this one was born there, but of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High Himself will establish her. The Lord will count when He registers the peoples. This one was born there, Selah. Then these who sing. As well as those who play, the flutes will say, all my springs of joy are for me. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dan's visiting from Orlando. Glad you're here, brother. Thank you. Um, it's easy to discern what the theme of this psalm is. Notice three times where it says, this man was born here, this man was born there. Uh, very much New Testament kind of a psalm. Uh, understand what God is saying here. God says, I love Zion. Now in Hebrew, it's, it's pronounced Zion, Zion, but in English, we say Zion. I love Zion. And God says, I love Zion more than any other place in the world. In fact, God chose Zion or Zion uh, as our place of where, where uh, we all will gather together for the Feast of Tabernacles, praise God which is uh, tonight is the last night on the Hebrew calendar of the Feast of Tabernacles. But in after the resurrection, we're all going to be on Mount Zion. And, and, and God is saying, I love Zion. I love Zion more than any other place on earth. But there are people in Babylon who I love. There are people in uh, Ethiopia whom I love. There are, there are people in Rahab which is the ancient name for Egypt that I love. Uh, and there are people born all around the world, God says, that I love. Um, and when God looks at a person, no matter where your origin is, no matter where you were born on this globe, God loves you no matter where you are, when you have a relationship with God, when you have chosen to give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus, you have a relationship with him, God loves you. And he sees you as being part 
of Zion. He sees you as part of being Israel. Israel, loosely translated, that's a transliteration word, a, a phonetic spelling of what it sounds like in Hebrew. What it means is uh, wrestling with God. That means you're in a relationship with God or you're governing your life by God. If you live your life in relationship with God, God loves you and his perspective that we're taught here is that he sees you as part of Zion, a part of Israel. And although people are born in Egypt, they may be born in Africa or at Babylon, it doesn't matter where, if they know God, God is, his perspective is that they were born of the spirit of Zion. And those who those of us who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we are born a second time. We are born of the Spirit. Some people say born again, born of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit of Zion. We became spiritually Israel, you see. So Zion today is a stumbling block uh, the State Departments all around the world really don't know what to do with, with you know, this the Israel-Palestine uh, issues, the conflict and all that. But from God's perspective, those of us who have given our lives in a relationship with God are part of spiritual Zion, and ultimately all of that will be re revealed, and there will be joy, there will be gladness, there will be that will be heard all around the world. And that will, of course, will come after the resurrection. Who's got a comment, a question, a takeaway from this really a difficult psalm from Hebrew to English, but a relatively easy psalm to decipher uh, that those who are uh, have a relationship with God, God's perspective is you are part of Zion. Who's got a comment? Uh, Arnie first. Yeah, um, this psalm is uh, is predicted. I guess Isaiah repeats it almost perfectly. Isaiah two two. I'm going to read it to you. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come the, go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Good job. Thank you, Arne. Who else has a comment, a question, or a takeaway? Psalm 87. Sylvia? Well, it's not Jew or Gentile. It's are you a member of Israel? Are you a member of God's family? Do you believe in the one and true living God? And as we receive the Lord in our hearts and our lives, uh, we become part of Israel. We are treated by God as part of Israel, part of his family, part of his eternal family. And as you, the more you speak the truth in love, the more you will find that the culture, the the God of this world is Satan, and, and the culture is going to come against that because it's the spirit of Antichrist. We are with Christ, so we are members of Israel. We are members of Zion. We are members of the family of God. And so as we speak the truth in love, it doesn't matter. They're going to push back on us. Get used to it. They hated Jesus. They're going to hate us. Okay, but the thing is, is that we are preaching love. And they will always say that we are hate mongers, which is just the opposite of what we stand for. We stand for love. We stand for even the strangers can be received into God's kingdom. And he is not willing that any should perish, whether they're, they came out of a Muslim background or, a, or a, any of the other uh, world religion. He doesn't care where they came from. He welcomes us with open arms as we turn our backs on the, the culture of the world and to the living God. Good job. Who else has a comment or a question? I see Sheila's hand up in the background. Um, I like what Sylvia said and Robert. And to define, we need definitions 
because with replacement theology, the church said it replaced Israel. Well, and then you talk to people and Israel is like ethnic, it's like Jews. Please know that God chose Israel, so there's no doubt he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not going to be some Allah or Buddha. There will be no doubt, and that's why Israel is picked. And through we are spiritual Israelites. We are spiritual Israelites. Does it make us Jewish? Does it? It's not about ethnicity or anything like that. And yes, we are a church. I mean, we don't, but we don't separate it. We are spiritual Israelites because the power of God will be shown through Israel. There's always a physical and there's a spiritual. You can't separate those either. And we can see if you look at Israel, the richest, I mean, everybody wants it. Do you see how powerful our God is? They're blinded. A lot of people don't see it, but if you look at Israel, you see not ethnicity, Jew or whatever, you see the power of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You preach it, sister. Yeah, just to build on that, God has preserved Good Israel uh, supernaturally. So the whole world has come against them. Good job. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Anybody? Most of the Psalms uh, that we've studied over the last many months start out, and this is something Carrie mentioned in one of her commentaries just tonight, they mostly start out with a big complaint, and then at the end of the psalm, the writer realizes uh, that all is well, and they end up praising God. Uh, not this psalm. Psalm 88 is quite negative uh, from the very beginning until the very end. Um, okay, Sheila, while you're on a roll, would you read verses 1 through 5, please, nice and loud? A psalm, a psalm. Of the sons of Korah. Am I saying it? Korah? Korah is fine, yeah, but if, if that's your first verse, then go through six. Oh, okay. You're reading from the Tree of oh, Life? Yeah, of course. Okay. Go ahead. Start with two. Ed and I, God of my salvation, day and night, I cried out before you. Let my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles in my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted with those who go down into the pit. I have become as one with no strength. Uh, good. Dan, uh, Roy, would you read 5 through 10? 488? Yeah. yeah. I set apart the dead. I'm oh, sorry, 6 through 10. You have put me in the lowest. You have put me in the lowest pit, in dark places in the depths. Your wrath has rested upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves set off. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an object of loathing to them. I am shut up and cannot go out. My eye grows dim from misery. I have called upon you every day, Lord. I have spread out my hands to you. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Or will the departed spirits rise and praise you, Selah? All right, that's good. Yeah, so uh, just to remind those who haven't been with us long-term on these studies, the word Selah, uh, you'll find all throughout the Psalms. And what it is, is uh, understood to be a musical term. Uh, and just think of it this way. Think of it as... Uh, uh, a choir is is re singing these verses as a song, as lyrics, and when you get to Selah, uh, what it is meant or intended to do is to have you, to have the, the orchestra continue, the music will continue, not the lyrics, but the, the music continues, 
And while the music continues, you are to reflect on what those lyrics were that were just sung. That's what Selah means. Now, looking at these verses one through 10, you, you, you have to say, well, sometimes life is just like what this is saying. I mean, it's pretty negative. Uh, we, you know, we have challenges. This is not a perfect world. People we love do die. People uh, do get sick. Uh, people do have car accidents. Sometimes a spouse might get up in the morning and leave the house and never come back. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes things do not get better. Uh, not, not every circumstance in life becomes happily ever after. This is why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Yeah, when a family member is on life support and they say you have to make the decision to pull the plug, uh, you know, you can't say, well, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. I mean, that's not the way it is. Sometimes life is not, not good or not fun. Uh, you just have to mourn sometimes with those who are mourning. And this writer is saying, everyone has abandoned me. I don't see any way out of the circumstances. And what does he do? He turns to God for help. He's at the very lowest of lows in his life. He is still praying to God. Now, does this not actually demonstrate how much faith this writer has, no matter how bad things have gotten for him? What does he do? He turns to God and he prays. When a person of faith thinks he is praying his very last prayer before he is doomed, what does that person uh, of faith do? Notice he prays again. See, this is a good definition of a person of faith. It is a person who prays again and then again. He prays every day. He prays again in the morning. He prays at noon. He prays at night. That's why in Jewish liturgy, we have, you know, we have the morning, noon, and night service. Uh, shaharit is what it's called in Hebrew for morning. Mincha is what they call in the afternoon. And Mariv, the evening services. Uh, you pray, you pray, you pray. That's what people do in times of need. Arn, can I get you to read verse 11, please? Nice and loud. Yeah, it's disappointing for you, I'm sure. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in abdomen? Abdomen. Yeah, faithfulness and destruction, uh, as some of the Bible say, this is a real problem. He's saying, how can God use me when I'm suffering like this? You know, our culture puts incredible value on productivity. We must be productive for God. You know, when we are sick, we're laying in bed, we are in affliction. Our culture is saying, get up and get busy. Be productive. You know, this kind of human thought creates mind games in our human nature, and we begin to think that we are not useful uh, to God. It makes us think that, well, I can't be of service to God. I can't serve God uh, when I'm sick uh, or when I'm handicapped. Uh, how in the world can I, can I serve God when I have all of these problems? Carrie, can I get you to unmute and read verses 12 through 14, please? Um, yeah. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hadest thou that face from me? Yeah, so when we suffer, we want two things. Number one, we want deliverance, right? We all want to be delivered from by God. Uh, that is what the writer has been crying out for in this psalm. He says, help me, God, deliver me. Get me out of this mess that I'm finding myself in. I want deliverance. And then if deliverance doesn't come, the second thing that we want as a human being is we want an explanation. Come on, God, I want you to tell me what's going on and why. I need to have a reason here. You know, 
I want you to come down right now and explain this to me. That's what our human nature wants us, want, wants. You know, so isn't it weird how we think to ourselves, if I can just figure this thing out, if I can just figure out what this challenge, this problem is in my life, and if I can just understand it, if God would just explain it to me, then I can say, okay, all right, well, the suffering that I'm going through, now that God has explained it, I, I can hang in there, you know? Uh, and the, the writer ends this psalm with no deliverance. This, the, he, he ends this psalm with no explanation. And in life, you gotta understand, in this life, be, be, before the resurrection, uh, uh, sometimes, uh we're, we're we're not gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna be called on to walk in faith without any explanation without any reason because because sometimes god wants you to grow your faith without explaining something to you if god would deliver all, all of us from every circumstance every challenge we have in life if god would explain himself every single time there would be no reason or no no need for us to have faith when we're in the midst of of, of the challenges of of life. Diane, are you still there? I don't see you on the screen. Yes, I'm here. I see myself. All right. Would you read verses 15 through 18, please, nice and loud? From my youth, I've suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. So this is the most unusual psalm as it starts out very negative and it stays negative. It ends negative. Uh, but the comment we can make about this psalm is that the writer of this psalm was a very godly man. Why? Because he continued, no matter how bad things got, he continued to pray to God. He continued to acknowledge God. He continued to show that God was the Lord over his life. He continued to demonstrate that he knew that God is the creator and the ruler over in the entire universe. And sometimes in life, we can pray and receive no answer. Uh, and, and things might even get worse. We, we, we pray again, and then we don't get another answer. And things continue to get worse. And God has not called us uh, to serve him. Uh, sorry, God, God, God has not just called us to serve him in good times. God has called us to properly represent him in good times and in bad times. All circumstances, all situations in our life, we are to represent God. And so here we have a very negative psalm, yet all of us can be inspired through this writing. Uh, we see a man where everything has gone wrong in his life, yet he continually and constantly turns to God, praying to God, acknowledging God, seeking God, and wanting to follow uh, God's lead, no matter how good or how bad things are, that's the way this man is. And so it's a great lesson for us that we are to continue to build our relationship with God the circumstances of life should not determine your level of faith. Your level of faith should be all in for God, whether things are good, bad, or indifferent. Yes, it's more difficult <laughs> when you're having challenges, but nevertheless, we are to always, uh, to always uh, show uh, our faith to God. Um, and if you're somebody who's watching this video recording of this Bible study uh, sometime out in the future, uh, and you have not made the decision to give your heart and give your life to Jesus, all you have to do is just believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and to simply say a prayer out loud. We're gonna tell you what that prayer sounds like. You can use the pause button from this recorded message and repeat it out loud 
and God will open up his arms and welcome you into his family for eternal life of blessings. Sylvia, what does that prayer sound like? Let us pray. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, confess I confess my sins, my sins and ask and for your forgiveness. Please come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I take complete control of my life and help me to walk in your footsteps daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and for answering my prayer and giving me everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And if you said that prayer for the first time watching this video, we congratulate you, welcome you into God's family and encourage you to continue studying the written word of God. Who has a comment, a question, a takeaway from Psalm chapter 88? Arnie, you're first, and then Sylvia. When I was reading this psalm, I, you know, I, I wondered what I would say to the writer of this psalm or to somebody that's feeling as he's feeling. And it, it's really simple because of your teachings, I have read Psalm 34. And in Psalms 34, it says, the Lord, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That's what I would say to somebody like that. Good, Good job. job. Good Arne. job, Arne. And Excellent. if you missed that Bible study on Psalm 34, you can go to our YouTube channel. We have over 900 Bible studies recorded, and we'll find that study right on our YouTube channel under the name Rob Chastner Bible Study. Sylvia? Are you sick or handicapped? You can still serve God by praying. We as believers do not retire from Christianity. Life is short. Do not despair. Walk in faith, even if we do not know his reason for allowing challenges in, in our lives. Ours, ours is not to have uh, to question the whys of God's actions. It's like calling the, the potter to task on why, why he chose to make the pot this way. Ours is to have faith through the valley of the shadow of death. And it will build our faith to look back and see how God has carried us through the good times and the bad. And I tell you from the perspective of a couple that has gone through cancer for 17 years. We can trust God through the good times and the bad. He's carried us. He's built our faith through every crisis in Rob's health. But we know that he is faithful and we clung to that and it built our faith through those challenges. So challenges are not always bad. Sometimes they can be a blessing in disguise. We need to trust and obey him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Good job. Who else has a comment? Okay, uh, Sheila first, and then we'll have Carrie after. I just want to remind myself and everyone else, we're kingdom people. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are covered. We are not of this world. We are kingdom people. So, but we are in this world. So this cry of desperation, we remind one another and help one another of the kingdom, um, be kingdom minded, that this is only temporary. And Bo Yeshua Bo, Jesus is coming again. Amen. Good job. Who Good else job. has a comment or a question? A takeaway. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Carrie, I forgot. Uh, unmute. Go ahead. This this psalm sounds like an Edgar Allan Poe writing. <laughs> he wrote uh, kind of negatively to me, but uh, it is the scriptures, it's the Bible. But I think the good thing of it is that it probably models a lot of what a lot of people are feeling, even maybe in these times. So a lot of times some people may say, well, it's the Bible is hard for me because my life is not like that. I have this and that happened to me. I've had this and that happened to me and it's still not good. So um, we can refer them to Psalm 88 
that this person had a lot of going on. However, the first thing they did was referred to refer to God as their salvation. And I'm and they are crying out and asking for their prayers to be answered and believe still believing. So I think this is really a good reference because some people sometimes <laughs> say, well, show me something that's real for me. And okay, well. Yeah, and uh, you know, Arnie uh, brought this this same message up a while back. You know, uh, it's, I've, it, it's the Psalms really. When when you see all of these complaints, uh, most of the Psalms they start out with complaints and then they they end up with praisings, uh, praise to God. Uh, but what it does is it shows human nature. Human nature has not changed since all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Human nature is fallen. We all have our complaints. We all have our issues and problems. And so this, you know, the writers of these different Psalms show their humanness, uh, but they also teach us that it's important whether, whether you're having good times or bad times in your life, the best place to go, they're teaching us, is to go to God. You pray, you plead to God as our Heavenly Father, and what Heavenly Father would not want to comfort their child uh, in times of need. Good job, Carrie. Who else has a comment, a question, a takeaway? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay. Uh, yes, Carrie, go ahead. You have another? I just wanted to end it, uh, and I forgot. What? But but if we can just teach people, and what, no matter what this all looks like, you know, like what may be going on even now in people's lives, and what may, we're, people are thinking about what may come. Uh, to know other other psalms, know the word, stick to the word. Psalm, I will look. I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Know what to turn to. If you know, if we can help people with that, you say yes. You know, things can be this way, but look to the hills. You have a good shepherd. You know that. That's right. Yeah. We were all sitting here having dinner tonight, and during our normal conversation, Roger, who's sitting right behind me, he quoted from uh, Psalm, was it 119 or 112? 118. He quoted right in the conversation from Psalm 118. Uh, and just remember, when you're, when you're praying and you pray the written word of God, you know that the, the word of God is in God's will. And so if you pray the word of God, you know that your prayers will be in the will of God. And it's always good to witness uh, to uh, or speak to other people, to speak scripture. Uh, you have no idea what, what kind of an effect that can have when you quote scripture to other people. It's the power of God. Yeah. Power in his name. That's right. <laughs> Amen. In his word. I've done it. In his word, yes. Well, I just want to... Yeah, I just want to thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance and uh, just delighted to Dan and Sheila for being wonderful oh. hosts uh, tonight and Thursday. And then Pamela, who's sitting right next right to me, here. and Gary are going to be hosting uh, the following week. Uh, we'll be staying yeah. with them up on Sage Mountain. Yeah. Uh, we hope we don't get nosebleeds when we get up that high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we appreciate each and every one of you for your faithful attendance. It's a great source of encouragement to us. Pray for um, one another. Arnie, one another. just I can't even begin to tell you how much, uh, how delightful it is to study the Bible with you. You're, yes. you're a good friend. Uh, and I don't take away from anybody else, but just especially Arnie, we've just watched him grow and just grateful to see you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, so so before we close, uh, you reminded me of something. Uh, let's see. I will hardly have the time, but but there there is a monk that is always placed in the service when they're coronating a new pope to who is put there to interrupt the service four times to mention to the pope that he's just a man, not to let his head explode from all the adoration from the position that he holds. So we're going to do the same thing for you, Arn. We're going to keep you uh, reminding you that you're, you're just a man.
Anyway, thank, <laughs> thank you all for your attendance. Who would like to volunteer to close us in a prayer? Arnie, it is. Unmute. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together to hear your words tonight because we are all poor and needy and we know that. And I'd like to paraphrase part of 1 Peter chapter 5 where he said, Father in heaven, we come to you today casting our cares on you. We choose to believe your word and trust that you are working behind the scenes on our behalf. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And just remind you, you that next uh, this Thursday we'll be studying John, Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 22 to uh, 36. And next Monday night we'll be studying Psalms chapters 89, 90, and 91. We hope and pray that you'll choose to uh, to visit us and uh, participate in that study. And uh, we look forward to